So uh, we'll start uh, the second session of, of presentations. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome so, uh, Bindi Brooks, uh, who is coming from the University of Nottingham and Center for Mathematical Medicine and, and Biology. So uh, Bindi uh, has been uh, working since uh, many years on, uh, on airways, so mechanobiology of, uh, of airways, focusing on, on asthma and uh, coupling so mechanics to uh, all the systems biology of, uh, of the cells in order to predict the fate of, of the airways so in, this, uh, in this disease. And uh, she recently uh, got an important uh, grant uh, from the Medical Research Council in the, in the UK, and which allows so them doing this uh, beautiful piece of work that she will be presenting now. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, uh, to this uh, summer school and in particular to this beautiful city. I really do like being here very much, so thank you. Um, so, uh, I should start off by telling you something about asthma. It's a really prevalent disease, um, a lung disease. Uh, most people know roughly somebody, somebody who has it if they don't have it themselves. Um, 300 million sufferers worldwide. And although mortality rates may not be as the same as those associated with cardiovascular disease, the severe cases of asthma require frequent hospitalizations. They get exacerbations at any point, and they're very hard to predict when they're going to come. And so the quality of life type issues are, are fairly significant and therefore a, a fairly big burden on national health services. Um, so what about the disease itself? It's... Um, as I already mentioned, it's a lung disease. It's a chronic lung disease. It's characterized by essentially three things. Inflammation, so you breathe in an allergen, and your body mounts an immune response. Lots of white blood cells of different <coughs> types come into the airway. Uh, Hyperresponsiveness, and what I mean by that is the smooth muscle cells that line the airway, they contract in response to a cascade of stuff after having inflammation. Um, and in, as, in asthmatics, that contraction happens really fast and to much lower doses of a contractile agonist than it does in normal people. Um, and airway remodeling, and this is associated with repeated episodes of uh, asthmatic attacks. And wh wh what happens there is in, you then get, over time, increases in smooth muscle. Uh, which, so here I'm showing a picture of a histology slide. So you've got, uh, on this side is a normal uh, slice through an airway. What we see, and what we see is increased smooth muscle in the asthmatic airway, an increased or thickened basement membrane, which is, which is essentially collagen, and increased epithelial, um, number, increased numbers of epithelial cells. So a thickening of the entire airway. Um, and this, in turn, can make the disease appear even worse because your airway contracts even more in response to the inflammation and the contractile agonist. Um, the, these three characteristics seem to be connected in some way, but people aren't really clear on what that connection is and whether one is a consequence or a cause of the disease. So does remodeling happen first? and does hyper-responsiveness follow, or is it all driven entirely by inflammation? Um, so these are all sort of underlying questions that, uh, that people are still tr trying to grapple with. One of the, uh, the things about all of, one of the main thing about all of this is it's an inherently multi-scale problem. So a clinician will observe things at the lung scale, trouble with breathing, wheezing, all of those sorts of things, and essentially, it, it is a result of, um, if you go all the way down to the subcellular scale, it's a result of these actomycin interactions that go on inside the smooth muscle cell that cause the smooth muscle to contract, that causes narrowing of the airway, that reduces re uh, resistance to flow, and therefore the stuff that's observed at the organ scale. I'm going to focus most of my talk on the multi-scale problem associated with subcellular to cell to tissue level interactions. Um, uh, and, uh, but then, of course, you can think about how this then has consequences 
further up the scale. So one of the biggest mysteries about um, asthmatic airways is that, uh, compared to non-asthmatic airways, is that if you take a deep breath, if you're slightly bronchoconstricted, you breathed in a bit of dust or pollen or something, you get a bit of bronchoconstriction. If, you have a no if you're normal, you take a deep breath, your airways become quite uh, relaxed and everything's fine. If you're an asthmatic, on the <coughs> other hand, you take a deep breath, and what might happen is you actually might get a little bit of a relief, for, but then very quickly you bronchoconstrict again, and you're back to your bronchoconstricted state and people haven't really understood why there is this big difference. So a number of studies, experimental studies, have been focusing on understanding how tidal breathing and deep inspirations affect uh, smooth muscle uh, response. So what this involves typically is uh, taking out an airway like this, taking a, cutting off part of, it, part of it and then cutting it into a strip so that your smooth muscle is lined up along the length of the strip in this way. And then what happens is you, they mount the strip um, and they hold the length of the strip constant. They apply a contractile agonist. And what that does is if you hold the strip at some fixed length is you get this increase in contractile force. So along here, I'm plotting force. Along here, we've got time. And what you get is this increase in contractile force and then which then plateaus to a maximum. Um, if at a particular point in time, instead of uh, keeping your length fixed, you start applying length oscillations, this is to mimic tidal breathing, what you get is oscillations in the force, and if you make, your, uh, if you make the amplitude of those oscillations larger, you get a decrease in the mean contractile force that seems to be proportional to that amplitude of oscillation. Uh, on this side, we're just plotting the force uh, as a function of the length. So as you're cycling through the length oscillations, you see this sort of change in the force length behavior. Um, so essentially, this sort, of, uh, this sort of observation led people to think, well, clearly, if you do a big, deep inspiration, then you're going to make enough of a change to your cell level contractile stuff that's going on, and that's why you get this reduction in force, and the bigger your the bigger your excursion, the bigger your drop in force. However, people have done, the, instead of taking a tissue strip, uh, another, set, another group of people have done experiments where you actually take out the airway, the whole airway, I'm just going to grab a big tree here in a sec, um, and, oops, I'm going backwards here, extract the whole airway, um, and then applied two different protocols. One is where they um, apply increasing agonist concentration, but keep the amplitude of the pressure oscillations fixed. And a second protocol in which they keep the agonist concentration. So remember, the agonist is the thing that's causing contraction of the smooth muscle. If you keep the agonist concentration fixed, but increase the amplitude of the, pressure tra of the transmural pressure oscillations, then that's a little bit like increasing uh, the length oscillation amplitudes. Okay, so the idea being that this is a little bit more like what might be happening in vivo rather than what you do to a tissue strip. And what they found was that, so if you look at these, so the main panels to look at are um, the, so the radius, what's happening to the radius and the thickness. Um, what they found is that in the top protocol where you just kept your, am your amplitude of oscillation fixed but increased contractile agonist, there was not much difference between the static case, a case where you had tidal breathing, and a case where you had tidal breathing interspersed with deep inspirations. Um, so that was, uh, that was the, one of those protocols. The second protocol where you have uh, fixed agonist but increasing amplitude pressure, transmural pressure oscillations, they found only a significant difference when the transmural pressure was really very large and which they believe was not necessarily um, what was happening in the tissue strip. You were getting changes with the tissue strip even at uh, much smaller strains. So the question was, uh, why weren't the results from the cell and tissue level recapitulated at the level of the intact airway? And we started getting interested in this question because we felt that maybe by developing a mathematical model of these things that we might be able to answer these questions. So this is essentially the, the uh, our multi-scale model. Um, 
I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail here, so if you have any questions at any point in time, please stop me and ask. I don't mind not getting through my, my, all my slides. So, um, so essentially what we're doing is we're starting off by saying we have an airway wall that's embedded in some parenchyma, the surrounding, the, the tissue that surrounds the airway, which is essentially consisting of lots of alveoli. Um, and within the airway, we have these fibers that are arranged in a helical pattern around the airway. Uh, and these fibers have both smooth muscle and extracellular matrix, essentially collagen, contained within them. Um, so then if you then, look, if you then look into those fibers, what we then uh, imagine is that they consist of lots and lots of these smooth muscle cells. And within those smooth muscle cells, you have these actin, myosin, contractile, machinery, uh, and I'll go into some detail describing this in a minute. Um, just, I just want to give you an overview for, for now. Okay, so uh, a little bit of detail of how we model the airway wall. In terms of sort of cardiovascular mechanics, it's relatively simple, uh, but it's, for the, it's, it's being done for the first time in airways, which is slightly surprising. It, it seems like airway mechanics is about 50 years behind cardiovascular mechanics, but here we go. So essentially, we're going to assume that my airway is in under plane strain, so it's being held fixed with no um, uh, axial deformation. And we're going to assume that everything stays axisymmetric. Again, that's a simplification because we've seen that there's quite a lot of buckling of the epithelial layer going on. But for now, it's simpler to think of everything staying axisymmetric. Uh, and then so you can write down these deformation gradient tensors. For those of you familiar with solid mechanics, it's all very straightforward. Those of you who aren't, you can just ignore this bit. But um, so then you then uh, have to apply boundary conditions. And the two main boundary conditions are that you're applying an internal, when you're breathing, you're applying a transmural pressure difference across your airway. So you've got uh, a pressure uh, acting on the inside of the airway, a pressure acting on the outside of the airway. Uh, and then at the interface of the two materials, the airway wall and the parenchyma, you have continuity of stress, radial stress and radial displacement. Um, then we assume that we've got these helical fibers embedded in the airway wall, two sets of them to ensure that everything stays axisymmetric, even during deformation. Um, and then these, there's two functions imparted to these fibers. First of all, the extracellular matrix that's contained within the fibers strain stiffens. So uh, as you stretch, you, um, you, you stiffen the material uh, and that the cells within those fibers are generating a contractile force. Um, and th again, that's all happening in the direction of these fibers. Uh, so again, you can write down the directions of these things in terms of the undeformed coordinates and the, and the deformed ones. Uh, and then you can, uh, and then we write down um, all of our constitutive laws in the following way. So first of all, we assume our parenchyma is homogeneous isotropic and compressible. So a little bit like what Bart was talking about earlier today, although the material, the making of the parenchyma itself isn't compressible, the air spaces in them get squeezed when you breathe in, uh, breathe out rather. And so you can think of the entire material as being compressible. Um, the airway wall we model as the, the underlying matrix being homogeneous, isotropic, but incompressible. Uh, and then we write down a strain energy function, uh, the Neohickian part of it. For the parenchyma, it contains the compressibility, uh, J not equal to one. Um, and in the case of the airway wall, we just have the J is equal to one. So you just have the, the uh, part associated with the first invariant. Um, and we then think about how we, uh, then as associate passive and active properties to the helical fibers. So this is done through writing down an expression for uh, the passive properties, which depend on these additional invariants. Uh, and they're characterized by two parameters, essentially. This C1, which is uh, related to the density of the fibers in the airway wall, and this parameter C2, which tells you how quickly you get an increase in stiffness. Of, of the um, extracellular matrix as you're stretching it. Uh, and then 
Finally, oh, uh, and finally, we write down something associated with the active part of the strain energy function. And here, what we're saying is that it it's, depends on this contractile force I'm calling A star, and that's going to come from my cell model, um, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but uh, it's only in, it's indirectly associated with stretch, not directly. So we can decom decouple the stretches from the contractile force. And again, yeah, I can explain that in a bit more detail, detail as we go. So the total strain energy function then is made up of the Neohookian part, the passive part associated with the fibers, and the active part associated with the fibers. So this contractile force A star is what we then need to figure out, um, and I'll come to that in a minute. But essentially, all of the stuff I've talked about goes into the Cauchy stress tensor, which then, uh, assuming conservation of momentum at each time step. So we're going to do a time-dependent problem, but at each time point, we're going to assume that this is true. So there's a quasi-static equilibrium. And what you end up with is a relationship between transmural pressure and the unknown radius, internal radius of the airway. So you apply a transmural pressure, and we want to know what, how the internal radius of the airway responds uh, and within that, you have this contractile force uh, generated by the, by the cells. So if, in case you missed it, um, I should have pointed out that the capital R's are all the undeformed coordinates and the small r's are the deformed coordinates. And in this expression, the only thing that you don't know is the little r a, which is the internal radius of the airway. So at every time point, what I want to do is solve this equation for Ra subject to what's happening to the contractile force in the cells. OK, so here's what the contractile force, where the contractile force comes in. So I've got a model here that, mo that looks at the cross bridge dynamics internal to the cell and, is re and relies on this idea that you've got this thick myosin filament um, that has got cross bridges coming off it and a thin actin filament that has got binding sites on it and that over, uh, when you have the right calcium and stuff in the cell, then you get phosphorylation of these myosin, of these cross bridges. They can attach to these binding sites and, what, and as a result, they can pull the actin filament relative to the myosin filament, generating a velocity, a shortening velocity and therefore shortening of the cell. Uh, so it's based on this uh, Huxley sliding model uh, combined with a high Murphy kinetic scheme where we assume that the my myosin cross bridges initially exist in an unphosphorylated and unattached uh, form. They get phosphorylated through calcium uh, within the cell. Um, and when they're phosphorylated, they're more ready to bind to actin binding sites, which become these, this, um, this actomycin complex. And they can cycle between these two quite rapidly. That's the thing that allows rapid movement of the actin myosin filaments relative to each other. And the important thing about this is that they depend on the uh, a local variable x, which is how far away your nearest binding site is from your, the unstressed position of the cross bridge. Um, so uh, a, a quick thing about the dephosphorylation of these complexes. They then turn into something that cycle more slowly, and they're called latch bridges in the literature, uh, which then can become dephosphorylated and return to the, to the uh, myosin cross bridge the unphosphorylated, unattached myosin cross bridge. Now, all of this stuff um, is governed by this equation here. So n is a vector that tells us what the fraction of um, how the cross bridges are distributed between these species. So you've got all of these species in this vector n. That n evolves in time as a result of um, uh, being either a contractile agonist causing shortening of the smooth muscle 
or if you pull on the smooth muscle, then you're, you're, you're modifying the velocity accordingly. And so n evolves according to this, uh, this sort of advection equation. And the reactions are all contained within this matrix T, which contains these rate functions um, that I've specified here. The, G, the, the attachment and detachment of these cycling cross bridges are governed by something that looks like this. The details don't really matter at this point, but the point is that they're spaced, they're dependent on this variable x, which indirectly depends on how, uh, how you're pulling your smooth muscle, which will come into play when we're applying oscillations to the, to the tissue. Um, and then the thing about all of this is that when you know what, when you, if you solve this equation for n, you can then figure out what the contractile force being generated is because the cross bridges that are attached, these two species here, cause, are, 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 are modeled as li linear springs. So uh, if you then integrate over all of the, all of the um, cross bridges that are attached, uh, and multiply them by the extension, uh, then you've got a con total contractile force um, as, as, and that's where our A star in the previous stuff comes in. Okay, um, quite a, a little, just a quick thing about this velocity here. All of this, all of N, all of these Ns here are variables at the cell or filament scale. So you've got this local variable X telling you how each of these ends are distributed. But this velocity here is essentially a macro scale pro uh, property because you, at the tissue scale, you're applying this velocity. Um, so uh, so the, all of the variables in here are essentially parameterized by this macro length scale R. Um, and I should give you a quick idea of what I mean by these distributions of N. So what at any time, T, you imagine you've got lots and lots of these cross bridges. They're distributed in lots of different, uh, they're distributed such that they are attached in lots of different configurations. So if I was to pick uh, a configuration where my cross bridges have a large and negative extension and I did a frequency, I plotted the frequency of it, then I would get something like this. If I then picked out all of the cross bridges that had a slightly smaller but uh, smaller negative extension, it would look something like this, and so on. And what you end up with is uh, a probability density function describing how n is distributed. Um, so at any point in time, you've got a distribution that looks like this. You apply some kind of stretch or, or, some, or you apply an agonist and things change, and that change may then drive a, a, a redistribution of how n of how n is, how n goes, and so this might be how it then changes. So you can imagine that if you've got lots of length oscillation going on, that those distributions are gonna change with time, and here is an example of how those distributions change for a particular example, uh, just taking a single cell and applying a, uh, a length oscillation. Uh, so you then have these kinds of changes in your distributions. Okay, so, We've put all of this together. What, what that means is that I need to solve this equation and my pressure radius uh, dis, uh, equation at every point in time during my length oscillation. So I've put all of this together into my airway model and simulating what happens uh, in, in that context. But I just need to describe these figures a little bit more carefully. So what I've got here is I'm applying a transmural pressure to the airway. Um, to mimic the, exp uh, the experiment I talked about. And I'm then outputting the radius that you get as a result of that transmural pressure. So if I do it very slowly, I get these curves that I'm, uh, that I'm thinking of as a quasi-static pressure radius curve. Um, and the black line at the top there is for a situation in which there is no contractile agonist and all you're doing is you're passively inflating your airway and as you inflate your airway, your radius is responding in the following way. So you can see that to begin with, you've essentially got what your, your neo-Hookian behavior, but then the strain stiffening bits 
comes in because collagen fibers are being recruited, getting stiff, and therefore you now have very small change in radius in response to this larger increase in transmural pressure. Um, and that fits nicely, so we fit that passive response to some, uh, pressure, to some pressure radius data from this particular, um, from the study that did those transmural pressure oscillations. Uh, and then be, after that, we then say, well, okay, what happens if you now increase the amount, if you actually apply some contractile agonist to this situation, and you do quasi-static pressure radius curves in that case. And so you then, we then have these predictions of what happens to our pressure radius curves in the presence of increasing agonist. Uh, and then on top of that, we then mimic the experimental uh, protocol where we keep the transmural pressure fixed, but, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the amplitude of the oscillations fixed, but we increase the contractile uh, agonist concentration. So what we see here is that when you apply the transmural pressure oscillations in the situation where you have this, uh, this green level of agonist, you get this loop here. If you apply, if you then increase the amount of agonist, you get this blue loop. It's a loop, but you can't really see it. It's a very narrow one. And then similarly, if you do the same thing for a higher agonist level, you get this sort of thing. So what we found is that you get these, you get a little bit of bronchodilations com compared to, so if you think about what your quasi-static pressure curve looks like, applying that oscillation has caused a little bit of a bronchodilation because your radius is now uh, at slightly higher, uh, but it's not, it's not very big. And very surprisingly, the one in which you actually had higher contractile agonist, you actually got greater, contract, uh, greater bronchodilation which is somewhat surprising. Most people assume that you've got, if you have a, con a contracted airway, you've got a stiffer airway, and therefore you're, just, you're gonna be able to dilate it a lot less. But we found that actually you can dilate it better, but it seems to depend on uh, where you might be on this pressure radius curve. And that's because when you take the slope of those pressure radius curves and plot them as a function of transmural pressure, then what we actually see is that the very nonlinear nature of these means that at the transmural pressure that we're applying the oscillations, we have, oops, what we have is that the blue one is at, is at a much, when you apply the transmural pressures on that blue curve at that transmural pressure, it's at a much more compliant state than the other two. So you would, you would, so as a result, what's happening is that when you're applying these transmural pressure oscillations, you are applying far more, you're able to transmit far more of the strain to the contractile machinery, which is then causing a reduction in the uh, contractile force, which is then allowing the airway to dilate more. Um, so we've actually been able to, so there's a relationship here between uh, how, uh, um, the, the, the amount of bronchodilation that you get relative to the st effective stiffness of the airway at the place in the pressure radius curve you're at when you're applying this bronchodilation. So in some sense, we were trying to reckon, we feel like we've reconciled the, the discrepancy that we've seen between the intact airway experiments and the tissue strip experiments because what's happening with the intact airway experiments is that they're not, they hadn't really taken into account the effective stiffness at which they were applying the transmural pressure oscillations. So it may be that, uh, what, uh, uh, before I go on to that, it may be that, oh, I'm trying, pressing all kinds of buttons here. Uh, here we go. It may be that what we really need to do to improve bronchodilation in a bronchodilated, in a bronchoconstricted, person is to find, somehow find where their airways are at their most compliant and then to try and apply a deep inspiration at that point. It may be that the reason the asthmatic uh, person is not able to bronchodilate their airways is that they're somewhere at this very stiff part of the curve and so, so any kind of deep inspiration isn't transmitting the strains needed to perturb the, uh, the contractile machinery in the airway. So 
Perhaps what we need to do is take a deep breath out before we take a deep breath in so that we're moving our lungs to a more compliant airway, uh, a compliant part of our pressure. In, in the case of a whole lung, it would be more like a pressure volume curve. Um, so that's just a hypothesis, something that we need to test. But what we did do is go back to the group that performed these experiments and ask them to, to uh, repeat the experiment at a, trans, at a different transmural pressure. And indeed, they showed that by doing that, that they were able to generate a much bigger bronchodilation depending on where on the pressure radius curve they were. Okay, um, so if you now look at, so if you just think about what you've got, you've got an airway, you've applied a transmural pressure to it, you've got a response in terms of how, the, uh, how, how much bronchodilation you've got in terms of the radius, of course, you've got internal stresses in the airway wall. And again, we come back to stuff that uh, Bart was talking about. And, and one of the main things that I want to point out about all that is that if you look at the circumferential stress, which is the, the stresses that the, 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 the dominant stresses that the smooth muscle will be under within the airway wall, what we find is that for as you, as you first of all, just for any uh, level of contractile agonist, and even in the passive case, that you've got this heterogeneity of circumferential stress as you go from the lumen to the outer part of the airway wall. And if you increase that contractile agonist, that heterogeneity changes. Um, and the other thing which I've not shown here is that if you've got a remodeled airway, so you've got a thicker airway wall, then that heterogeneity is exaggerated even further. Um, and what I've shown here is, first of all, stress. So the circumferential stress plotted as a function of radius, um, both at the outer wall and at the lumen. And first of all, straight away, you see that the, uh, the, the qualitatively, the shapes, uh, although the shapes are similar, quantitatively, they're quite different. But in particular, what you can then do is look at how these uh, st stress strain curves vary with agonist and with transmural pressure. And so that's kind of what I've done in this picture. So it's essentially, it would be a 3D surface if I was to plot it as uh, radius, circumferential stress, and transmural pressure into the slide. But what I've simply, what I've done to make it easier to visualize is simply connected up the points that uh, are essentially isopressure lines. So, um, so for zero transmural pressure, as my contractile agonist increases, I would follow this curve here, but at a higher transmural pressure, I would follow this red curve up here, for example. And the difference between what's happening at the outer wall and what's happening at the lumen is significant, and we think may have uh, some implications for how the smooth muscle then responds as a result. Um, so uh, that's kind of um, that's kind of where I want to stop here for this part of my talk. And uh, um, I'm, but I, I um, I'll <coughs> carry on and go on to describe uh, some further work we've been doing as a result of what we've learned here. But I just want to give a sort of a part way summary. Um, so first of all, I just want to say that. In doing this, we've ended up developing a fairly comprehensive biomechanical model of the airway that combines both the dynamic subcellular contractile force generation with the nonlinear tissue level um, mechanics of the airway. Um, again, like I say, this is relatively simple compared to a lot of the cardiovascular models, especially the kinds of things Bart was telling us about this morning. But it, this is essentially the first time that anybody's really looked at it in this way. Uh, and we've learned a, quite a lot, we feel, by doing it. Um, the, the thing that's come out of it is that we wonder if perhaps we've been looking at this whole deep inspiration thing a little bit wrong. Maybe we need to think about it in terms of where, where can we take a deep breath to maximize the benefit of taking that deep breath. And maybe it is associated with this nonlinear pressure volume relationship that we know Problem, uh, pro exists at least pressure radius relationship at the level of a single airway, and then we need to think about how that translates to 
uh, pressure volume relationships at the level of the whole lung. Um, and then finally, um, these stress heterogeneities that seem to exist and get modified as a result of uh, both the dynamics of breathing as well as um, the geometry of the airway itself uh, means that the smooth muscle and all the other cells in the airway are being subjected to quite different micromechanical environments depending on where they are in the airway wall. And we wonder whether this has some effect or some, these things are responding to these stress heterogeneities um, to give rise to airway remodeling in a particular way. So we know that mechanical cues play a big role in how, smooth, uh, how cells in general respond. And so we then went on to think about how these heterogeneities might play a role in airway remodeling, which essentially brings me to the second part of my talk. Um, uh, but before I do, does anybody have any questions about what I've already said? I feel like uh, I've gone through in quite a lot of detail, so, no? At the end, yeah. all right. Okay, so as I said right at the start, um, we don't really know how these three characteristics are, um, how they interact in asthma as a disease and in its progression. Um, so what we've done is we've kind of built on the on the airway model that I've already described, but, in, but started to think about all these other aspects and how they might link to the mechanics of the airway. Um, and then we've, uh, in parallel, we're running some experiments in a mouse model of asthma. Uh, and it's, it's a very, very well established mouse model that uh, we know causes remodeling um, through challenging with an inflammatory agent, and that is um, this overalbumin. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do with this study is to test a hypothesis which is that although airway remodeling may indeed be initiated by inflammatory mediators or inflammatory factors, we feel that it, it is being perpetuated by mechanical factors. So we're, so we're developing a model and experiment that, that is essentially trying to test this hypothesis. Okay, so I'll just give you an overview of, of, um, of what sort of things we're incorporating into this. Uh, first of all, we imagine that our inflammation, the inflammation that your airway sees, is a result of challenges to your airway because of things you breathe in on a day-to-day -day basis. So it could be uh, some allergen like, a, uh, like uh, pollen or something, or it could be pollution, uh, etc. So so we have some notion of some challenges that uh, occur as a function of time. Um, in, our, in our particular uh, mouse model, we actually, have an, we actually know when that's happening. In humans, of course, it's completely random. In the mouse model, we know exactly when we're challenging. So we've got a really good handle on the input into that. Uh, that challenge causes a rise in what we call an inflammatory factor mu. So it's it lumps together a whole bunch of things that's happening in the airway, which includes the influx of inflammatory um, cells like eosinophils, neutrophils, uh, all white, essentially white blood cells that migrate from the circulatory system into the airway. Um, and that in turn causes uh, activation of things like histamine within the airway wall, which is a contractile agonist. So there's this link between inflammation and contraction because of this, of this process here. Within the mouse model, we can also challenge with, directly with contractile agonist, and that would then enable us to test a hypothesis that, uh, that looks at remodeling that comes purely as a result of bronchoconstriction uh, independent of inflammation. Um, so each of those things then have a consequence. The, the inflammation, we imagine, causes a phenotype switching between what we think of as essentially contractile smooth muscle and proliferative smooth muscle. So this is essentially key to our model, our, remo our model of remodeling. If all our cells proliferated at the rate at which we know they do in vitro, for example, then our airways would just close within six days. Uh, a rough back of the envelope calculation would tell you that. 
So what we imagine is that most of our cells are in a quiescent or essentially just a purely contractile state, um, but that every now and then they get, there's a switch to a more proliferative phenotype, but that, that it doesn't last very long in that phenotype um, and goes and returns to this contractile one. So we think that the inflammatory factor, this mu, the level of that drives phenotype switching. So it affects this rate here. Um, and, and it can also have an effect on extracellular matrix production or degradation. So we also have a, a part of our model looking at that aspect. Um, we then imagine that the contractile agonist that's being generated in exactly the same way as I described in the model previously, generates an active contractile tone. So the, you, that gives rise to these tissue stresses that I described. And that in turn may affect phenotype switching in the way that, uh, that mu does. It may affect the proliferative, the, the rate at which proliferative cells um, divide. Um, and equally, we know that there is some uh, uh, sort of mechanotransduction effects that also then cause further contractile agonists to be released. So one of those, one of those um, hypotheses involve activation of TGF beta from um, latent stores in the extracellular matrix. Another hypothesis involves compressive stresses of the epithelial cells causing uh, release of endothelin-1. So all of these things can act as either um, contractile agonist or proproliferative factors. So we are incorporating these within our modeling. Uh, and then we also uh, uh, incorporate the notion that these proliferative cells lay down their own extracellular matrix. And again, there's a hypothesis or a, a thought that these, the new extracellular matrix that's being laid down in these airways is potentially of a different type and potentially pro proliferative in some sense. So all of these things we kind of incorporate in this, in this sort of large model, uh, which we will then test uh, in, a, in different ways. So the nice thing about having a parallel mouse model study going on at the same time is that we know exactly when we're challenging the mice with this with this of albumin, but also we have control mice as well. And we sacrifice mice, um, uh, control mice uh, early on to get an idea of how much smooth muscle is within an airway and how much extracellular matrix is within the airway um, to, to fit in with, the sort of mod with, with our model that, we're in co that requires these measures. Um, so that tells us what our control airway geometry should look like. These things in, uh, feed into um, this frequency of event type input. And then we also sacrifice mice at different time points following challenge. So we've been challenging a certain, with a certain protocol, and then we take time, then we sacrifice mice at these different time points. And again, we're able to measure for those mice exactly the amount of smooth muscle, uh, amount of collagen or extracellular matrix, which then enables us to come out with uh, a remodeled airway geometry, um, both in the mouse model and in our simulated model. And this then allows us to validate the, and or figure out what sort of mechanisms are important, uh, are underlying the remodeling process. Um, so, uh, a, a, just a brief overview then of what goes into the model of remodel. So all of those things are the dynamics, the way in which the constituents may change. But of course, those constituents are, are, are within uh, a geometry that uh, is undergoing, that has mechanical stresses associated with them. So this is the sort of overview of how we incorporate those, uh, the, the, the increases in smooth muscle uh, and extracellular matrix and so on. So first of all, we imagine we have this uh, undeformed radius uh, or undeformed geometry, um, which I'll call a reference configuration. So all the capital R's like in my previous model. And then it, we, the, the, the dynamics then tell us how 
increases in smooth muscle and extracellular matrix then gives us a grown configuration according to uh, 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 the equations underlying that. Um, and I may just show you them briefly. Um, so that, but that's a stress-free configuration. And what we know, of course, is that the, air, the airway is always under some kind of transmural pressure and there is some contractile forces there. And that gives us, then we then have, like in the previous model, um, a, an elastic deformation, F, that then tells us what our final configuration at any point in time is. But the thing about all of this is that at this grown configuration, this, this process here from reference to grown configuration or this grown configuration to the next one is, is informed to some extent by what the mechanical stresses in the airway wall are as well. So it's this highly coupled situation where this grown configuration depends on the stresses uh, or the mechanical state from the previous time point uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, that's, our, that's our idea, that's how we're setting it all up. Uh, the volumetric growth, as I just mentioned, is governed by the dynamics and stress feedback, and the elastic deformation depends on the transmural pressure and the fiber stress that um, I talked about in the previous part. Um, okay, so I think what I'll do at this point is just to say that this is very much work um, uh, in progress. Um, if anybody's interested in the details of what goes into our um, into into this into this part of the model, then I'm happy to discuss at any uh, at a later point. But I'm going to I'm going to run out of time here, so I'm going to stop there. Um, essentially, we're uh, trying to couple the both the mechanical and uh, biochemical processes that are going on inside the airway wall to understand how remodeling may happen. Um, and we've been able to identify a in a preliminary way, so maybe if I just skip forward to, to that. In a preliminary way, how different parameters within the model affect uh, what's going on. So first of all, here I'm just showing what happens if you, um, if you uh, compare what goes on with uh, changing inflammation magnitude and how quickly that inflammation resolves. And what we find is that there's a that you can you can uh, do a parameter exploration that tells us how the contract how the how the um, airway remodels over time. So this is showing you the diameter the internal diameter of the airway uh, some five days after challenges have finished um, and. So we can see, uh, so we can, so along here is the amplitude of the inflammation magnitude and along here is the, how quickly that inflammation resolves. And you can see that if it resolves very slowly and you have large amplitude, then you get really rapid growth of the airway wall. Um, but the other, the thing that's kind of important here is what also how quickly the contractile agonist, so you end up with this kind of positive feedback loop, which where you have this contraction, it causes further contractile agonists to be released, and that then gives a positive feedback loop that means that it takes a long time for the agonist to clear off even after challenges are finished. And here what we've done is quantified the number of days the agonist hangs around for um, uh, post-challenge. So for the same set of parameters, you can see that um, the, the agonist hangs around for quite a long period of time in this part of the, for these, this parameter choice here, uh, but clears much more rapidly for this parameter choice. So it's, um, so what we find is that um, the, the, there's a potential for an increased contractile tone uh, depending on how, how the inflammation um, uh, the inflammatory challenges that might be that you might um, encounter. Um, similarly, and, and then what you can do is look at how the radius. Um, so what I'm plotting here is the the radius of the airway as a function of time. And what we're seeing here is what that contractile agonist is doing and how the circumferential stress is responding within the airway wall. And what we see here is that you still even after challenges are finished at day 50 you're still getting an increase in 
in the airway wall, the thickening of the airway wall, even though um, challenges are finished. So there's this sort of uh, period in which things are still going on, even in the absence of challenges. So these are all the sorts of things that we can look at with this model. And in combination with the mouse model experiments, we might be able to identify the sort of underlying mechanisms that might be driving uh, what's going on. So that's the sort of idea of this work, which is very much in progress. And these are very preliminary results. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to speculate too much on what's going on at the moment. So uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just skip to my acknowledgments um, and say um, uh, that uh, this is essentially work. The, the first part of the talk was essentially uh, all work by Jonathan Hyans, who was a student at the time. The, the second part of my talk is, all, is work essentially by Andrew and Andrew Bullock and Michael Hill. And then I've got other collaborators in both mathematical sciences and uh, all of the uh, respiratory medicine people running the over mouse model. Um, and then my funding there as well. So I'll just uh, stop there because I think I'll come up. With Okay, Bindi, thank you very much uh, for this very comprehensive uh, description and, um, and, and the mathematical tools that you're using to, uh, to, to, to study the, uh, the airways and problem of, of asthma. And um, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a very nice uh, example and how uh, you cope with uh, indeed uh, complexity and uh, rationalizing it and then further then couple it with, uh, with evidences and then use the model so as a, not as a predictive, but much more as an exploration, as an explorative tool, yeah. and which has to go hand in hand, in hand with, uh, with experimentalists and, and medical doctors. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a very nice example of that. So other questions? Um, in your model, the, um, the agent that triggers the, um, the inflammatory status is always considered something external, or there might be like an endogenous state that... Um, in, yes, we think it's always external. Most of the evidence associated with asthma is that it is external, driven usually by things like, I mean, the biggest thing these days seems to be things like pollution. But at the same time, if you're allergic, if you have allergic asthma, it'll be things like um, uh, things like pollen, uh, that sort of stuff. But yes, it's extrinsic. It, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the really interesting talk. And I also very much like the fact that you're trying to couple these two temporal scales. This is where you see like the acute effect and what it has on the, lo on the longer scale for remodeling, which is, I think, something we should try to do much, much more because that's relevant in, in the clinic in the end. I was just wondering, it's like one of the things that you said is like while you presented in a way as 2D uh, simulations, but you said that your fiber distribution is a little bit like spiral-like within the airways. So I was wondering if there's like a differential change in, in the radial versus longitudinal forces remodeling and things like that and then partially related to that is like when you say like a deep breath might be important whether a diaphragmatic versus a thoracic deep breath might make a difference and whether you can see these differences uh yeah that's actually a really good point um the so uh, yes i've presented it as a 1d thing everything is 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 purely a function of radius but we do see changes in longitudinal stresses definitely because it's in plate strain uh, but you're totally right. When we do a deep breath, for instance, we've got, uh, on a different project, we've got some uh, CT images for the start of a breath and the end of a breath. And we've reconstructed the, uh, the airways. And what we find is, sure enough, you get uh, a lengthening, of course, of the airways along with dilation of the airway. Um, and we're just in the process of trying to understand how this model responds when you have lengthening of the airway at the same time. And, but the, 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 the complicating factor is that the lengthening and the dilation are related to the transmural pressure. So 
so, um, so whereas most, most models of this kind, you specify in advance what your axial stress stretches, uh, and then say, well, what, here's what happens. But here, it's all, co it's all connected through that transmural pressure or transpulmonary pressure, of course. So um, yeah, so we're still in very early stages of looking at that. And um, what we've, uh, I'm trying to think what we found so far is that, um, that <coughs> lengthening uh, affects the bronchodilation as well to, and in some counterintuitive ways. And we're not 100% sure uh, how much of that is, is actually physiological yet, so. And how much do you think there would be the influence of the vasculature with regard to the airways? Can you model them totally separately or do you need to model them coupled? Um, so it can, I guess it depends on the question you're asking. So of course for gas transfer, the two things are intimately related, but we, uh, in terms of um, purely thinking about the, uh, how the smooth muscle in the airway is working and the bronchodilation, they're somewhat separate, but uh, um, there is one aspect of it in terms of remodeling. So it seems that during remodeling, you also get increased uh, vasculature around the airways as well. So obviously that's going to have an effect then on how much inflammatory mediator comes through as well. Uh, so, so there is obviously connections there, but I think that's maybe more of the longer term stuff. And also when you look at the vasculature, probably on the, on the smallest level, the pressure gradient over the airways will be determined by the vasculature, but it's probably then mainly the larger airways which are the most determinant, no? Or I'm not completely sure. So, Do uh, the small airways also contract in a similar, like the alveoli? And oh, that? right, or no, no, no. Are so they the, totally independent? So the alveoli tend to have no smooth muscle in them anyway. So that's all, that's all of the transmural pressure, uh, transpulmonary pressure goes into expanding most of the alveoli. So yeah, yeah, there's not much smooth muscle beyond the, yeah, the actual terminal bronchus. Just last small question. How much influence is there from the shear stresses that come from the air kind of circulation? Uh, so, so the actual, uh, so the shear stresses are really, really small because it's air rather than blood. Um, so, but uh, so far nobody's really looked at whether even those small shear stresses might be having some effect. Uh, it may be that's, that the epithelium are tuned, uh, epithelial cells are tuned to those small shear stresses. So far they've been completely neglected in, uh, in looking at this. It's all essentially been normal, normal stresses. Well, I, I, I do have uh, a couple of a couple of questions. Uh, if, if I understood uh, correctly, and in the first part of the talk, so the way the way you you, you relate so uh, the active force part of the cell uh, scale to the to the tissue scale is mostly probabilistic, right? Because you have this R, which is probabilistic, so distribution of the different activation of of myosin heads. So uh, in a sense, if you had very few of them, then you can think of it in a probabilistic way. But when you then have lots and lots of them, we can then write down the deterministic equation that I, sh the partial differential equation that I showed you. Um, so it does become deterministic uh, at the level that I'm looking at it. Right, so if you, you, if you, if, if you think of uh, tissue damage, for example, where you would have fibrotic, uh, fibrotic event and, and loss of capacity of contractility, so uh, you, you might become even more probabilistic and then you, you, might, uh, be you might be able to explain through the model. So, um, so maybe a, di a large diversity of results between uh, different patients with disease. Right, so, um, so I guess I should have made clear that here, of course, I'm just assuming all my cells are identical and they're all going to respond in exactly the same way, but you're right. If I was to go to the level of modeling individual cells with, with some fibro fibrotic change, making, uh, fibrosis making changes to some part of the cells or some part of the tissue, I should say, then yes, you're right. You, you, you would get, uh, yeah, exactly as you say, yeah. But just, so here that's, that's another thing that I find very nice in, in those kinds of model is that so of course you're developing the models according to a specific research target that you have, 
but I think along the way you're creating tools that can be that can be reused for much more to test much more hypotheses, and uh, that's I think that's great strengths of of this kind of approaches. And another question that I had is that, and then second part is the remodeling part. So if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the, the the chart of interactions that you have, so at it's characteristic of complex systems, and right in one box you have much more than uh, three and in three interactions at a time. So, uh, how are you coping with uh, the resolution of this? Is that a Boolean network? Uh, do you have stochastic uh, distribution of results? Uh, so, um, so what we're going to have in terms of uh, the mouse? So, from the mouse data, we're going to end up having quite a large. Um, set of results so for, uh, per mouse, something like um, of the order of 50 to 60 airways. And of course, we have n, we'll have n equals five mice per, per time point. So the way we're planning to do it is to sample from, do a sort of a, ra fit a, a distribution to those, to the input data, uh, sample from those, um, and then generate a set of uh, a set of distribute a set of results which also will have some kind of distribution associated with them, um, but all of the underlying stuff uh, is driven by deterministic ODEs. Um, so we'll be also ran we'll also look at doing some Monte Carlo simulations where we're randomly drawing from distributions of parameters as well. And in the longer term, we're looking at using Bayesian inference type techniques to try and uh, try and do some uh, parameter inference as well but uh, that's sort of a, a sort of longer term yeah thank you very much so maybe if there is no further questions then we can move on yeah. so thank you again thank you. Thank you.